because I had grown up, my parents never bought a house. We rented all what? of their lives. I had I had no real estate investors around me. And when he said those words, cash flow positive, I thought, holy cow, I have no idea what that means, but I want that in my life. Welcome to another edition of Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef and I am thrilled that you're here. And you are going to get tremendous value from the rock star that we're interviewing today. Her name is Annie Dickerson and I had the pleasure of being on her podcast. I don't remember when, but it's been a while. But uh, she's a, a ball of fire. She's a hoot. Her and her partner, Julie Lamb, uh, co-founded a company called Good, Good Egg Investments. They're in over 8,000 units. And we are going to have a lot of fun today. Welcome <laughs> to the show, Annie. Thank you, what Rod. A, Thrilled to treat. be here with what you a and treat. your listeners. Yeah. So, uh, well, let's have you start like we always do. Mm -hmm. Just tell us your story because you've got a very interesting story. <laughs> Fourth I, grade teacher. Oh, man. And now you yeah. got 8,000 freaking doors. Holy cow. I never in a million years would have imagined that I would be sitting here talking about real estate investing. Of all things, I mean, I was an immigrant to this country, got here when I was four years old. From? From China. China. I was born in okay. Beijing. Wow. And uh, so, you know, all my upbringing, my parents were focused on get straight A's, go to an Ivy League school. And I did all that. And I thought, okay, well, now I've made it. I've done all the things. Now I should have that life that I want. And I started out, as you mentioned, as a fourth grade teacher with Teacher Teach for America, had big dreams of helping to close the achievement gap, the opportunity gap, and uh, taught in inner city schools outside of Washington, D.C. No kidding. Wow. Whew, talk about front lines. It wow. was, uh, yeah, it was quite an experience, eye-opening experience. And from there, I decided I wanted to go into um, game design. So I wanted to make educational games. You told me that kids. earlier, yeah. and the two just, that just oh, yeah. is not a parallel. And <laughs> the reason I say that is typically someone that's a teacher, um, it, it's typically not a super analytical role. Right. And yeah. game design is pretty analytical. It can be. There's yeah. Well, there's the creative side and the analytical side. Okay, so you're on the creative side. Well, okay. yes. Okay. Uh, I would say more so on the creative side. Got it. Got it. Um, it's yeah. funny because... Um, you know, here I am, fourth grade teacher, right. straight A's all my my life. And the last video game that I had played when I went back to school to study game design was Super Mario Brothers. Hmm. And so I was only used to a couple of buttons on one controller. And uh, I went to school with all these guys who had been playing games their whole lives, had a controller attached to their hand, the claws, you know, they're pale because they've been inside all day. And, you know, we had these playtesting labs and, where we'd play games and analyze them. And all their characters on screen would be like sniper quality, you know, going around the corners uh -huh. and very tight turns. And here my character is just bobbing its head up and down because I'm like, wait, this controller has two joysticks. What does that mean? And so it was quite a learning experience. But that actually, that's a you'll see that that's a theme in my story, putting myself in places where I was outside of my comfort zone. Oh, I love it. You know, if you ever want the... If you, I don't know if you've ever had the humiliating experience of playing a young child on oh, a video game that it. they shark you in <laughs> oh, yeah. and, and you're humiliated mm -hmm. by a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I, I feel your pain. Yes. So, um, so please continue. Game yeah. design. So, you know, it was... So I should mention that along this time, real estate was something in the background. So you it know, was kind of there, but it you... It was kind of there, but okay. not really anything front and center. What had happened was... My husband and I got married right out of college. We were 23 mm -hmm. and, you know, we went down the checklist, right. get married. What's next? Oh, buy a house. Buy we got to buy a house. So we were living in when we were living in D.C., we decided to buy a house, but we were in our young 20s. So we thought, let's buy a condo or a loft, something trendy and cool. Right. And thankfully, we had a realtor talk some sense into us. And he said, you know, a condo or a loft would be great, but... In D.C., there's a lot of these row homes, and a lot of these row homes not, have not one, but they have two units, mm -hmm. and you could live in one unit, and you could rent out the other. Told you to house hack. Good. And That's he said, awesome. 
and I'll never forget this, he said, if you play your cards right, someday you could get that to be cash flow positive. And because I had grown up, my parents never bought a house. We rented all of their lives. I had I had no real estate investors around me. And when he said those words, cash flow positive, I thought, holy cow, I have no idea what that means, but I want that in my life. Nice. So we house hacked two properties in DC. We started naming them after the alphabet. So we had Alpha and Bravo. And then when we moved to California, we had Charlie and Delta. Okay, and keep it And our goal <laughs> was to get all the way to Zulu. Wow. And so, um, but once we moved to California, um, where we are now in oh, the Bay Area. Is one of you military? Uh, Those no, are military just, terms. <laughs> you know, the thing is, people ask me all that time because I moved around a lot, right. went from Beijing to Iowa, New Jersey, Memphis, Philly, D.C., Vancouver, and now Bay Holy Area. Cow. People ask me all the time, oh, military family. No, it turns out. So when I was growing up, my dad, ch my dad changed jobs a number of times. And mm. it turns out that's genetic because then I changed jobs it. a hereditary. number of times. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, okay. you know, so the house hacking thing was something we did mm -hmm. in the background. That was your teaser, your taste. It was, but it was never something I thought I would take seriously or something that I would focus on. Mm. I was over here, goody two shoes, trying to climb the corporate ladder, going mm. from, you know, teaching to game design. And then I went into instructional design, creating mm. trainings for companies. Mm. And, but the thing is, in the 10 years after college, I had nine different jobs. Wow. trying to fit myself in here and there. I realize now I was supposed to be an entrepreneur all along. But right. at the time, I was like, oh, this is just not the right job. Let me find the next one. Let me find the next one. Hmm. And right around this time, we were living in the Bay Area. Um, we had young kids at the time, I think, you know, four and one mm -hmm. around that time. And my husband, when we moved to the Bay Area, he became a real estate agent. We oh. had both been in tech, Perfect. but we moved to the Bay Area. And he's like, honey, I'm going into real estate. Okay. And my first thought was, well, I guess if you're going into real estate, I can't go into real estate. We can't both, we can't be that couple. So I mentally crossed real estate off my list. Mm. Um, but, you know, a, a few years into his business, he was doing very well. Mm. He asked me to help with his business. I was reluctant, but then I said, okay, fine. I'll read a book or two. And in the process, I, I decided that I would redesign his website because that was within my wheelhouse. Mm. So in that process, then I discovered he wanted to help people who were like us, kind of starting out investing in real estate. And this is how little I knew about marketing at the time. I said, well, I think there's this thing called content marketing. I think I'm supposed to like write some blog posts or something for you, put them on your website, and then right. people come and learn about it, and then they'll work with you. And so that was the gateway hmm. because once I started researching and looking into this real estate investing thing, mm -hmm. all of the pieces of the puzzle started to come together for me because what I realized then was, wait a second, this could be my key. Forget about my husband's business. Mm -hmm. If I just, I did some back of the napkin math and I said, if I just invested in X number of doors, all cash flowing this amount, then I could replace my salary. I don't have to work. Forget nine jobs in 10 years. When I don't have this? to work at when, all. When was this? This was 2017. 2017. 2017. And at the time, we only had those four house hacks that we had done. We still had them all, mm -hmm. those duplexes. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, forget the Bay Area. It's too expensive here. Right. And we had young kids. Kids have a lot of stuff. I was like, oh, we don't want to keep moving around. Let me look somewhere else. But I had no idea. I literally, it was like I pulled up one of those maps of the whole United States. And I said, well, if not here. Where'd your finger where? drop? <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, after a lot of digging, a lot of research, um, looking at a lot of lists, I ended up in Huntsville, Alabama. Interesting choice. Which okay. was a, at the time, it was a great time to get into Huntsville. It was right on the upswing. And what got me into Huntsville, and this is something I still use um, when we're looking at markets to this day, even for large multifamily. Um, I read Dave Lindahl's book, Emerging Real Estate mm -hmm. Markets. And I remember, you know, beyond the job growth, job diversity, population growth, landlord friendly, all that's a given. The one thing he mentioned was that, that, made me pick Huntsville 
was he said it's great to find a market where there's a natural barrier to growth. That's yeah. why the coastal markets do mm -hmm. so well, because right. at some point you can't keep building because the ocean's there or the mountain range is there. Right. And Huntsville, unlike a lot of other uh, markets in the in the southeast or in Texas, Huntsville has um, the Redstone Arsenal. And if you pull up a map of Huntsville, you'll see that just catty corner to downtown Huntsville, there's this huge swath of land, the Redstone Arsenal. It's government land. Hmm. So the military is there, the FBI is there, and can't you, build there. You can't build there, right. And so I knew, I looked at the job growth numbers, and I knew there was a ton of growth coming to the area, hmm. but at some point they weren't gonna be able to, to build anymore. And sure enough, you know, we, we went from having nothing out of state to within one year, actually less than one year, probably within three or four months, because here's the thing, when you're based out of the Bay Area and you call basically any broker in any other market, mm -hmm. it seems like everything's on fire sale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So this broker that I talked to, I said, well, what do you got? You know, I'm looking for small multifamily. And at the time he said, well, we have these four plexes. They're about $200,000. Okay. And I said, what do you mean for like the down payment? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and he that, goes, you get no, that reaction from anybody from California. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take out all of them. Give me all you got. So we pr qu qu pretty quickly, uh, amassed a small portfolio of I think around 25 doors in Huntsville. Okay. And I thought, oh, this is so Did you fly easy. out there and look at these things or did you just buy them sight unseen? I, or Because Huntsville's, I yeah. mean, if you were going to look at the map, Huntsville's not even halfway across. Oh, I mean, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's way more than it halfway across. Yeah. Right. So, so it's, it's, you know, there's lower hanging, you, you know, <laughs> lower hanging fruit might have been closer. So, yep. So yep, that's why I, I asked. Yeah, no, I know that now. Okay. Uh, okay. But uh, we did ultimately fly out there, but it was only after we bought. No kidding. The first, the first uh, property. Guys, don't do that. Don't do okay. that. <laughs> okay. Go look at the, um, I Google Street Viewed everything I could. Right. Um, and the first property I bought was actually off of LoopNet, where deals no go to die. Yeah. Six unit, small property. But here's what gave me the confidence to invest in it, even though it was sight unseen. Right was it was across from this place, I forget the name of it now, um, but it was an old middle school hmm. that they had closed down and they had renovated the entire inside and they had shops and eateries, they had an ax throwing place. Oh, cool. Cool. And this was back in you know 2017, early 2018. And I thought, what is this doing in Huntsville, Alabama? This is the kind of place that you'd see in San Francisco. And I thought this is that path of progress thing that Love they're it. talking about. Love and it. the six unit was right across the street from that. Well, that's a no brainer. And so, yeah. Now, th didn't you make a phone call in 2017? Oh, I did. <laughs> I did, you know. And so around this time, as we were building up this, this uh, small portfolio, I thought, this is what I should focus on. Forget my husband's business. Forget this instructional design thing I'm doing. I should be focusing on this. If I could focus full time on this, imagine where I could take it. And I wasn't thinking about multifamily or anything at that time, just buying properties for myself. And so you were naturally one of the people. Were you listening that I to my podcast to. back then? I was. And see, guys, back then, a lot of people don't know this. I was taking free phone calls from listeners. <laughs> is this one? Of, is that what it was? One of those? No, I actually, I reached out to you on Facebook oh, Messenger. Oh, you did on Facebook. Okay, yeah, because yeah, I, I was taking free phone calls. I'd do oh, like, I don't know, I 10 to 20 a, a week. And I wow. say, I'm not going to sell you anything, but I'll help you if you need yeah. the help. And it really helped me build my podcast. Yeah. So you called me. Yeah, so I reached out to you and I said, hey, Rod, thank you so much for all the value. I have a question for you. I'm thinking about, you know, expanding my real estate portfolio. I really want to focus on that. And at the time, there was just this burning passion right. in me. And I said, you know, should I? Should I do it? Should I quit my job? I've been reading all these books about when to make the jump, and when, you know. And I was hoping, I was hoping, Rod, that you'd say, yeah, quit your job, go after your passion, do it. And of course you said, nope, not a good idea. Hang on to it. Your lenders are going to want to see this. And I thought, yeah, that's good practical advice. I should hang on to my job. I should keep my job. Should. We should all over ourselves. Oh, we? yeah. We sure do. <laughs> and uh, She quit her job, FYI. One month later, okay. <laughs> one month later I was out of there. Oh, that's having, funny. Uh, Nobody listens to Rod. Never done a multifamily syndication before. I quit my job with no net. and uh, Wow, no net either. See, no that's net. what I tell people. And if you're thinking, 
what she, don't even though she's a huge <laughs> success just don't freaking do it don't here's do it. why okay <laughs> now she's a rock star in in and i just call her a unicorn but you know if you quit your job and you don't have income or you don't have a net fear pops up and what does fear do it freaking paralyzes you okay and that's and i'm sure i said that when mm -hmm. i responded oh yeah uh but um but that's okay it, it all worked <laughs> out for you obviously but uh, oh that's funny I, I i had to have you throw yeah. that in just because it was cute when you told me before we started recording um so huntsville okay so you went you bought some units in huntsville then then what so i never intended for this to happen but i talk a lot about how this business that we've built, it seemed to come through me. It didn't come from me. Mm. It was almost like I was mm. struck with I like that. some higher power. Oh, I like that. And so around this time, when we were building our portfolio in Huntsville, it was all consuming. <laughs> it was all that I could talk about. Every time we'd get together with friends, they'd be like, Annie, what are you up to? What are you doing these days? And I'd say, you know what? You were oh hoping they'd God. ask, yeah. right? You were hoping they'd ask. Well, right. I'd say, oh my gosh, I'm looking at this market. I'm looking at these properties. And I just got one last week. This is, you know. And because I had that natural passion, people love that. No matter what you do, people love that Let passion. Let me stop you for a second. Let yeah. me stop you for a second. I literally just taught this at my Warrior event mm. this weekend. When you love what you do, mm -hmm. work is play. Yes. And when you love what you do, you never really work another day in your life. And it juices you so you're passionate about it. And what's required to influence people? Passion. Passion. Yeah, so mm -hmm. there you go, guys. So, you know, and I told my students, my warriors, I had a few hundred of them here in Sarasota for a two-day networking and deep dive and stuff, uh, underwriting and area analysis. And, and I told them, if you don't absolutely love this yet, start associating pleasure with it because you can learn to love anything. Yeah. But, and, but I also said, if you can't learn to love it, for God's sakes, go do something yeah. else. Life's too short. Yeah. But learn to love it and then you'll be passionate and then mm -hmm. it, it, influencing people is so much easier because oh, people yeah. want to be around people that yes. are passionate about what they talk about anyway i just want to yes. hammer that piece on please continue yeah so that's such a, a great reminder because that that passion just i mean it consumed everything and mm -hmm. so every time you know i i go into all this you know i love what i'm doing let mm -hmm. me tell you about it and so naturally people would ask they'd say oh well teach me I want to do that too. And at the time I wasn't, you know, having investors invest with me. I was mm -hmm. just doing it on my own. So right. I said, yeah, no problem. Pull up a chair. Let me go through it, uh, the process. Right. And I go through the, you know, 25 steps, right? Mm -hmm. You look at the market, you talk to a broker, your property mm -hmm. manager, you analyze the deal. You know, I'm somewhere along the way, inevitably, every time their eyes would glaze over. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they'd say, you'd lose them. Oh, no, 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 no. You mean no. you actually have to work? No, that's <laughs> not what I want. You misunderstand. No, no, no. I just have this pile of money and I want to put it into real estate, but I don't want to do that work. Could you just do it for me? You know, you do maybe in the next property that you do, you just, I'll put some money with you. And at the time, because I was investing in these $200,000 fourplexes, I thought, well, there's not really that much room in there and I don't know how to do it. Yeah. And I don't want to be responsible for people's money. That's, you know, if I lose my money, that's fine. But, yeah. you know, I don't want to be responsible. So I'd say, you know, I'm sorry, I don't do that. Good luck. And I had enough of these conversations that one day I, this epiphany hit me and I said, wait a second, I've been having all these conversations. All these people have the same problem. Mm -hmm. And if I could just take some time, get beyond my fear around it and mm -hmm. figure out the solution, I could help all these people. Sure. And so. And of course, help yourself as well, because you can sure. buy more well, assets. So just to back up for a second so you you were doing this on your own you had a a, a big demand because you're obviously a great communicator and you're, you're you're showing this passion you had all these people that were like you know let me invest with you and so um did you get some help did you hire a mentor because syndications are complex oh yeah you know so so i assume you did i did so mm -hmm. you know once i started digging into it mm -hmm. First, what happened was I, th I, the furthest I could see from my vantage point at the time was a JV partnership. Mm -hmm. So I started looking into that and sure. how the logistics of that worked. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere in my research, the word syndication popped up. And at this time, I had been investing in real estate, even in the background, for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I had heard the word syndication. Mm -hmm. 
and I started looking into it and I thought, oh my God, this is what I need. Mm. This is what I need to help people. And also I was so angry. I was so enraged that I had never come across this term before. Mm. I said, why has this never, how, how come I didn't know that I could passively invest all this time? I thought the only way was to be a landlord. Right. And so once I found out about that, I said, okay, people deserve to know. People deserve to know that it doesn't matter if they ever invest with me or not. They need to know that this opportunity exists. And that became a big part of my why, my driving factors, just to get this information out there. And so one of the first things I did was hire a mentor because mm -hmm. I knew this was going to be a very complex undertaking. I was going to be taking other people's money. I didn't want to be responsible and make a big mistake. I wanted to do follow in other people's footsteps. Sure. I knew avoid that, mistakes. Exactly. Right. And so I, you know, it was a very small price to pay for a huge amount of value mm. to have somebody, you know, who's been there before, show you the ropes. And, you know, the thing is, like, you can't get this from reading a book because you can't right. ask the book, I've got this problem w with my investor. Or they said this or I ha I'm un uh, uh, I'm underwriting this property. This came up. What do I do? The book's not going to answer you. You got to have a real live person right. to be able to interact with. And so that was the value of a mentor for me. And I've had, I can't even count well, you believe how in many. mentors, period. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. oh yes. I've got mentors 100%. right now myself. Right. I still do too. Yeah. Many, many mentors and coaches over the years. So, you know, I love what you said, um, that your mindset was get this opportunity out there. It wasn't so much self-serving. It was more about, you know, power moves to those who serve. And the fact that you approached it from, you know, educating people about the opportunities with investing passively is the reason you're so freaking successful because it comes across in everything you say. And, you know, the, the, it's not self-serving. And so, you know, I, I loved hearing you say that. Um, so, uh, so then you, you went through somebody's program, um, and, uh, you so, know, and I, and I, by the way, I get people all the time in that same situation. They've bought some fourplexes, maybe they have 20, 30. I've had guys that have, you know, a few hundred units, but they've never syndicated. It's all mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. And they just, you know, that's intimidating yeah, it is. when they realize it's, it's not that big a deal, mm -hmm. you know, that it's hiring an attorney and dotting I's right. and crossing T's and using a portal and whatnot. You know, we went through quite a bit of it this weekend, uh, with the warriors, but, uh, but it's intimidating when you don't yeah. understand it and you don't know it. Yeah. Right. But I think it's more intimidating when you don't think about all the people you could be helping. Yeah. Like you're oh, saying, like when you when you think about just, oh, my fear, I'm scared of this. I don't want to go mm -hmm. through the hassle of this. It is intimidating. It's right. daunting. Right. But when you think about the hundreds or thousands of investors that you could help mm -hmm. to grow their wealth and help their families mm -hmm. and pay it forward, right. suddenly it doesn't become such a big deal anymore. No, agreed. I agree completely. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic vehicle. Um, it's not something you dabble in, right. okay, when you're dealing with other people's money. There have been some train mm -hmm. wrecks recently yeah. with people that have syndicated and lost deals and lost millions of investors' capital because they, they, they don't take it seriously and they, they make, made huge mistakes. And, but, uh, no, I love it. So, so, so then I got into syndication. You got into syndication. I quit my job. Wow. Had no ne no safety net. Right. Having never done a syndication before. And, and you, you co-GP'd with somebody, I assume? Yeah. So we got very lucky. Um, I, I quit my job in January of 2018. Mm -hmm. And literally the very next week, I met my, my business partner, Julie Lamb. Oh, no kidding. At okay. a, we, we were both in the Bay Area at the time, but we met at a conference in Denver. Okay. And, um, you know, at the time, I was thinking, you know, we hadn't joined forces yet. She was running her own thing. I was starting. Was she doing point. syndication already? Yeah, she, oh, she was, was. So she, she had was. some experience. Okay. So she was doing it probably, you know, had done it for, you know, six, seven months at that okay. point on the side. Mm -hmm. um, she was still working her full time job. And um, she and I kind of connected because we both had a passion for helping women and moms mm. to get into real estate to create passive income for their families. Mm. And at the time, you know, I thought, I'm going to do this all myself. I can do this all on my own. And I thought, how hard it could it be? I did a fourplex. What's uh -huh. the four, 40 uh -huh. unit or 100 unit? It's probably the same thing. Right, right. And, uh, you know, I started, you know, learning the underwriting, all this stuff. And around that time when I met Julie, uh, 
you know, I got an opportunity to co-GP, mm-hmm. not with Julie, but with another group. And Let me interrupt for one yeah. second. So, guys, what we're talking about here is, you know, the, the operators that put a deal together are the GPs, okay? They're the general partners in a deal. It's actually a misnomer because it comes from the days of limited partnerships, but that's the, the nomenclature that's used for that. And so what will happen a lot is, you know, someone's buying, taking down a big asset, uh, you know, multi-million, uh, tens of millions of dollar asset, and they will reach out to other people to help them raise money for that deal. Um, and, and they're brought in as co-GPs. In fact, this deal we're doing right now that we just closed two days ago in San Antonio, we had three co-GPs in on that one that each raised a million dollars each. Now, here's the caveat, though, and I want to spell this out to you guys real quick, is you cannot just raise money. You have to be involved in other things in the deal, significant things. And so like each one of the three co-GPs that, that we had on this uh, San Antonio deal uh, was there at the due diligence. They helped do unit walks. They, they, they uh, gathered bids for different uh, pieces of the huge CapEx budget that we have there, the renovations. We've almost $4 million in renovations we're making there. And, and they're actively involved. They're, they've been on all the asset management calls. Or, I mean, they're going to be on all the asset management calls, but they've been on all the calls leading up to this point. So you can't just raise money. But, um, but it's a fantastic way to get going, okay? It sounds like you stuck with it, though, as well. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a great, because if you're good at something, let other people do what you're not good at. I mm-hmm. tell people, you know, mm-hmm. and I told people at this Warrior event this weekend, I keep referencing it because it's fresh in my mind. It was yesterday. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we do, we force networking. And I tell them, tell them your superpower. Everybody you meet, get in groups of five. And I force it by geographic area and, 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 and meet meet five people and you know exchange information talk about what you're good at see what they're good at and see if there's some alignment because you know lots of different hats you can wear here i oh, kind of yeah. stole your thunder you were talking about doing it all yourself and i yeah. just stole it but <laughs> no. but yeah but no this is yeah. a freaking team sport okay bottom line and so um but so you were involved actually in the underwriting as well though not just the yeah okay. yeah i did okay. a little bit i i wanted to just like when i was in game design i mm-hmm. went into game design with some design experience mm-hmm. but i wanted to be able to build an entire game by myself so i focused on the programming and the analysis the the level design things like that mm. So that I could create my whole um, my own game if I wanted. And same when I went into multifamily, I said, "Here's where I'm strong. Let me get a lay of the land of everything else, mm-hmm. just so I have enough to be dangerous." Well, understand so to speak. it. You need to yeah, understand it, exactly. Though, right? Even if you you're not leading it, you need to understand it. And I actually got into the, the raising capital initially, kicking and screaming because I thought. <laughs> Give me the underwriting. Let me talk to the brokers. I'll do anything. I don't want to raise capital. That's the worst part of the whole thing. Can be, depending on who you talk to. Sure. But 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 I I thought that's the hardest part. You got to talk to people about money. Oh, my gosh. I was like, how can I possibly do that? But, you know, somebody said, well, you know, why don't you just give it a try? You haven't done it before. Give it a try. And, you know, your investors will remain your investors. Mm-hmm. And you'll just start to build this reputation mm-hmm. of somebody who can give them access to great opportunities. Like when, like when you find a great hole in the wall restaurant mm-hmm. and you tell people about it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, huh, I guess I could do that. Yeah, I guess I could just tell them, you know, that I've been investing and these are great opportunities, mm-hmm. you know. So I started that way. And so, as, question. Yeah. Did you reach out to your IT crowd there in San Francisco? Ah. So here's one of the benefits of having had nine jobs in the 10 years <laughs> after college. You got a hell of a role. I had a much larger professional network than yeah. a lot of people. Right. And so I, had, I started by, you know, actually early on, what I did was I, I made a list of all these people. Um, that I thought, I, you know, because I hadn't talked to them about money, so I only had a guess of what their net worth might be. Mm-hmm. And But I made a list, um, and I knew that to get into this business, to, to get people to trust me, especially when I didn't have a track record of right. my own, I had to lean on that personal touch, that personal connection, as well as my own personal experience. And, and? you likely leaned on Julie's experience as well. Had she done a and deal the, yet? Yes, she okay. had. And yes. That's why my warriors right. are so successful. Yeah. My coaching students, I mean, we're mm-hmm. over 200,000 units that they own now, Wow. which I'm really proud of. It's mm-hmm. less than six years. I, I, I think it's quite a bit more than that. We just, they don't even post in the group anymore sometimes. <laughs> so I, I, we, I've heard about like three or 4,000 units this wow. weekend that weren't in the group. But <clears throat> the reason I bring that up 
is most of those deals are done between warriors because when someone's starting out, yeah. they can lean on someone yes. else's resume. Yes. And they can say, we have 200 yes. doors, 300 doors, 1,000 mm -hmm. doors, and that's how you get started. That's is exactly that, right. I'm, I'm assuming yeah. you did the same thing. That's exactly right. Yeah. We, um, I leaned on the experience of the, mm -hmm. the lead sponsor that oh, I was she, working That's with. right. It was yeah. somebody else's deal. So, yes. Okay, yes, so yes, they, yes. they had experience, right? Yeah, got exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as soon as I got into it, and I had never had a sales job or anything like that, mm -hmm. but I had been a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I realized very quickly, wait a second, I could do this. This is just about teaching people. It's education. About what this is. And that's where I realized, so as, as soon as I started having those conversations, I actually chucked everything else out of the yeah, window. Because that's your, that's your wheelhouse. I said, that's absolutely oh, your wheelhouse. This yeah. I can do. Yeah. This I can do. So I started just, you know, and that passion for, for teaching people about this opportunity, that's what really drove me. Mm -hmm. And I started creating all these blog posts, these scenarios, these videos, and just teaching really, people. Really, education-based marketing right. is what it is. Yep. That's the way the world is now. And, uh, uh, you know, I've, that's that's the reason that I've been as successful as I have, you know, with, by doing these podcasts. Yeah. You know, it's the and same, same, yeah. same, same. And clearly it worked because you got me into this. I got and you. <laughs> I, well, I, won't, you. I won't take credit for that, but thank you. But, yeah. uh, uh, but you know, um, no, I love it. And, and guys, I will tell you, candidly, raising capital is probably the easiest part of the whole business if you really get right down to it because it's just relationships. Mm -hmm. It's just telling people you know about how exciting this business is it's in, it's it could very well be the most intimidating piece of the business sure. but it but actually when you get into yeah. it i think it's probably the easiest because it's just and the most fun and it's the most <laughs> fun sure you know um um so so how much have you can i ask yeah can i ask how much you've raised since you started since we started in 2018 <clears throat> we've now raised about a hundred and uh I think uh, I don't know the latest numbers, but over 130 million. <laughs> that is freaking incredible! Wow. It's st I still remember those early days, and you know, 2018 was a fantastic time to get, and we had a lot of oh, opportunities yeah. Oh, yeah. to go There's... co GP. And the, at the beginning, the bar was at 500k. If we could raise 500k, we could get ourselves a seat at the mm -hmm. table, mm -hmm. and that was a stretch. Mm -hmm. I remember the first one we did, we fell flat. We thought we could, when Julie and I joined forces, we thought, well, if you could raise 500K on your own and I could raise 500K on my own, surely we could do a million together. That first deal, we raised 420K. <coughs> and that was through a lot of phone calls, a wow. lot of meetings, because we didn't have our own track record to stand on. Mm -hmm. And But it got us off to the races. And mm -hmm. that first year, we did a total of nine co-GP opportunities. No kidding. Each first one, year. First year. Wow. And we brought go about big or go home. 500K oh. to each one. By that wow. second year, we finally were able to bring a million to each one. And then um, pretty soon COVID happened. We paused for a bit. But then as we came out of that, all of a sudden we jumped to four or five million a deal. And no kidding. Yeah, we, because we kept this focus, as you do, on the education piece. Yeah. Not on selling people on how great our deals are, yep. but really helping them understand what this is about. Fantastic. And so there was so much pent up demand hmm. that by the time we released a new deal after kind of COVID had become the new normal, people were, you know, they were really wanting to get in with us at that hmm. time. Fantastic. Now, I mean, Whenever you, the people that add the most value in this world, I talked about that this weekend, the people that add the most value in this world are the most successful, bottom line. And you focus on adding value. I've got a stack of books behind me that is probably 18 inches high of books that either I've written or been involved in writing about every aspect of this business that I give away. Some of them are best in class, honestly, better than what's on Amazon. And, uh, you know, it's the same It's the same dynamic. We created a... Um, uh, what do we call it? The cash flow portal. What do we call it, Matt? Cash flow club. Cash flow club. And, and it's an educational platform for investors. They can, they can watch my videos, read books, uh, emails, articles, webinars, all for passive investors. I don't think there's anything like it out there. And it's the same thing. It's just education-based marketing um, to educate. And, you know, when you add value to people, it's the law of reciprocation. Yeah. It just, yeah. you know, the, first of all, you build credibility with yes. them. They, they feel like they know you. And and um, and I got to say you. that there's something that you do that I think is 
beyond the beyond of everybody else in this space and it's you lead by example through because you share so openly and vulnerably oh, about nice your experience and it's such an inspiration because you know there's you, you can find a dime a dozen of gurus and mentors out there who will just teach you the you know the how to do it and this is what you do and they're kind of selling themselves too but i could tell right from the get-go that you know you were here because you really wanted to help and inspire others and get them going in this business. And I still, oh, to you. this day, I remember many of the stories that you've shared. Oh, and yeah. I lost a lot yeah. of money. And, yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because I, I actually um, got really vulnerable <laughs> recently on an interview. I had my relationship coach in the, sitting where you're sitting. <laughs> and uh, that came up a lot at this weekend where people had listened to it, where I talked about what went wrong with my mm -hmm. ex. And she's about my best friend, but mm -hmm. uh, had the things that I needed to improve. So, but thank you for saying that. You know, I, I am I'm beyond an open book. I'm transparent <laughs> to a fault sometimes. I say things I shouldn't say, but, but uh, thank you. That's why that. you've got a great editor. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah, except, uh, you know, when I'm in front of a few hundred of my students right. and, I, and I drop something that I probably, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but you are so freaking successful. You're a little dynamo, and I always want to know where that drive comes from. Where does that passion come from? What's the... What's the why that's driving all this? Mm -hmm. You know, I asked you about your kids. Yeah. And we really didn't go deep, but, yep. but t t talk about that for yeah, me, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So when I got into this, I remember hearing about this um, exercise, exercise called the seven whys. And so I, it was on a podcast, and so I went home right after, and I did it. the one where you go deeper, it. deeper, yeah, deeper? Yeah, yeah, you okay. go deeper. So you ask yourself, why are you doing this? And at the time, I was... You know, I was thinking about why am I quitting my job to go into mm -hmm. real estate? So, you know, the first one was very superficial. And then what you do is then you say, well, why is that thing important to you? Can, can you give, a, can you give yeah. a little more concrete example? This is very sure. valuable. Guys, oh, yeah. you really need to listen to this. This is an incredible mm -hmm. exercise you can go through. Yeah. So, so for example, uh -huh. uh, and I don't remember exactly what I wrote yeah, at the what, time. Even but if you have to make it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just so so they you get start the very, you know, why do you want your quit your job? Right. And I might have said, um, because I, I don't like my job. I want, I want the freedom. Mm -hmm. And so the next, the next layer is mm -hmm. then, well, why, why is it important why to do you, you want freedom? To, to have that freedom? Right. And I say, well, hmm. well, I guess I want to spend time with my kids. Why is it important for you to spend time with your kids? Hmm. Well, I guess because I want them to have my presence in their life. Mm -hmm. Why is it important for you to have their your mm -hmm. presence in their life mm -hmm. and you go deeper and the first three or four layers are they come pretty quick mm -hmm. by the time you get to five six seven it's Im nearly impossible and i remember i sat there with layer number six mm -hmm. trying to get to the final one for probably 20 minutes i was stumped mm -hmm. i don't remember exactly what it was but um i remember when i finally broke through I was bawling. No kidding. Yeah. It That's reached so me to my core. And it usually relates to love in some fashion mm -hmm. um, when you get really deep mm -hmm. like that. I've done a lot of this work with Tony yeah. Robbins. But yeah. uh, no, I'm glad you shared that. And guys, you should try that when you're going to make a big decision because it's, it's a fantastic exercise. So back to your why. Yeah. So, you know, at the time, I, I thought that my big why was freedom because mm -hmm. I had had nine jobs in 10 years. Sure. I felt these shackles of being in the W-2 world sure. and I thought, I just want to be free. I didn't want to sit on a beach, but I wanted to be free to do the work that I loved. Sure. And, and that was my why at the time, mm -hmm. but it's evolved mm -hmm. since then. And, and, they, and they do evolve. Yes, FYI. Okay. that's true. Okay. And so I, I am very blessed because I did get a chance to, you know, have some of that freedom with my kids and mm -hmm. to do the things that I love. We've traveled mm -hmm. the world. We've mm -hmm. done some amazing things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I've realized is that business, and especially when you have a business partnership, mm -hmm. it holds up a great mirror to all those blind spots mm -hmm. that you never otherwise could have seen. Mm -hmm. And unlike all those jobs that I had, where I could just give my two weeks notice and go on to the next one. When you're in a business relationship, you can't very easily leave. And so mm -hmm. it holds your feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned so much and mindset wise 
and personal development wise Mm -hmm. and that has become now my new why that I've evolved into is this personal spiritual development Mm -hmm. because I would now want to figure out, you know, how can I be the best version of me so that in every conversation, it used to be when I was young, I used to think I want to change the world. I want to impact as many people as possible, thousands and thousands of people. I want to change the world. And now that I've become older and wiser and I've done some of those things, I said, you know what, I don't want to impact 10, 20, 30,000 people on a very superficial level. I want to, it doesn't matter how many people, even if it's 10 people, Mm -hmm. but if I can impact them deeply on a soul level, just through being who I am and helping them, meeting them where they're at, that's what I want to do. But in order to do that, I have to dig deep into myself Mm -hmm. and I have to find those blind spots and I have to figure out how to be the best version of myself, not just for me, not just for them, for my kids, for everybody I encounter. So how are you going about that? I am... I read um, about 65 books last year. No kidding. I went to a a number of retreats. Mm -hmm. I've done plant medicine. I've done, I've explored all the things because I want to go to the edges. Well, you're in the right spot for that San Francisco. Right. (laughs) Very progressive. You don't have to travel very far for those retreats probably, but okay. I've done lots of different things because I want to be able to figure out what works for me and That's what nice. can push me beyond my boundaries again going outside of my comfort Fun, zone. isn't it oh yeah this it's, exploration it's yeah. very revealing yeah. and so that has become my new why mm. um but in the process you know you mentioned visualization that's been a huge part yeah talk about talk yeah. about talk about because you, you you shared yes your, your beautiful home share, share that share that visualization please there is uh, one of the first podcasts we were ever on was um a podcast called so money uh with Farnoosh Tarabi. And Mm. at the end of the podcast, she asked us this question, if money were no object, and before she could even finish the question, I said, a house with a view, I would like a house with a view. And it was because at the time we were living in Oakland where the houses are very close together. Mm -hmm. And right next door to us was this hot pink, Barbie pink house that was falling apart, siding was falling off, broken windows, the whole nine. Opportunity. uh, Yeah, but they refused to sell because Uh, grandma had died in that upstairs bedroom. So uh, they wanted to keep it in the family, but it was an eyesore. That whole side of the house glowed pink during the day. So I said, you know, I just want a place where I can look out. Doesn't matter what the view is, but just so long as it's not a hot pink house that's breaking down. (laughs) But, you know... I didn't realize at the time that there was something holding me back. Hmm. And it was th- that on some level, deep down, I didn't think I deserved mm, a house so with a view. so common. Same here. Same, that, yeah, we, it's that imposter syndrome thing, isn't it? Yeah. And I thought, who am I to have a house with a view? Here in the Bay Area especially, I would be literally throwing my money out the window to have a house with a view. And Surely, some of I the can... best views on the planet oh, yeah. in the Bay Area. Oh, yeah. So I I did that podcast interview, said that thing, and I said, you know what, but I don't really deserve that. Mm. But over the the following years, as we were building the business, it kept, it was something in the back of my mind, and I thought, wouldn't that be nice someday just to have a house with a view? Mm -hmm. And so eventually, as I did more of the mindset exploration, I first had a vision board around it, and then I turned Mm -hmm. that into a mind movie. And for those of... Oh, describe a mind movie, please, please. Yeah, oh, it's like a a vision board on steroids. So a mind movie is basically you create a short movie, uh, a short video, um, with images and or, you know, B-roll video. Yeah, and it was set to a song that was very meaningful to me. And I, it was just maybe, you know, two or three minute little video. And what I put into it were all these images of homes in the Bay Area with beautiful views. And every morning, you know, I do my meditation, my exercise, everything. And then I'd watch that video. And I had no idea how I was going to get one of these houses. You don't have to know the how. Right. Yes. You just have to know the what. Mm Mm-hmm. And so I watched it and watched it and watched it, but I was still, you know, a few years, you know, I probably was watching it for maybe a year, still no closer to a house with a view. But one day, 
one of my mentors, I was having a call with her and I ha happened to let it slip that this was one of my dreams. And she said, well, but would you, and I said, but, but I would be throwing my money out the window. But she said, but would you do your best work in that house? And I said, oh, that's good. And I said, yeah, you're right. If I were looking out, if my office desk were looking out over the Bay Area and I could see the water and I could see the mountains. How inspired would you I be? would be so inspired. And I would do my best work and think of the impact that that would have on other people. Boom. And so that broke a dam inside me. And I swear it was, you know, I, I, was, I wasn't even looking at, even though my husband is a real estate agent mm -hmm. and we could get in anywhere, I wasn't, I hadn't even looked at any listings for years. But pretty quickly after that, one day, and I hadn't tied the two together, mm -hmm. but one day I was like, wait, I just, you know, I wonder what's out there and I started looking and the the bug bit me and I could not stop looking at listings and my husband and I probably went to see 40 houses over the mm. span of the next couple of months mm. and this was in 2021 mm. at the summer of 2021 height of that crazy COVID. market well COVID too right it was the bounce back from COVID because 2021 okay 21 right because people were now okay. itching to they were like okay this is the so new a lot normal of competition. a lot of competition how the first house we bid on was listed for 1.2 million and went for 2.5 million oh, <laughs> 1.2 to 2.5 yeah. wow and we were like what is this market we're competing in and the house that we have now I Rod, I could not have even imagined it in my wildest dreams. Really? Describe it, has, it, describe it, please. Oh my gosh. It, when we first moved into the house, one of my favorite features was we couldn't even find our kids because there were so many different rooms and nooks oh, cool. and crannies. We've got, we're in the Berkeley Hills. I don't We've know got, Berkeley Hills, but is it like one of those hills where you, they have those steep inclines, you gotta park your car with the wheels turned in and yeah, stuff? Yeah. Is that it? Okay. We've got sweeping views of the Bay Area. We oh can see God. four bridges wow. from our window, floor to ceiling windows. I have a wow. view from my laundry room. We have a hot tub in the backyard. We sit there, we could see the, the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, I mean, how, how magical cool is that? Is that? Wow. We Not only that, but we have a uh, my mom lives with us mm. and she has an in-law suite all to herself with French doors that open out into onto this beautiful lawn oh, how beautiful. and it was just it was more than I could ever have imagined not only uh, when Oakland when we were living in Oakland we had one living area mm -hmm. and so at night my husband and I after dinner after the cleanup we'd spend time picking up all the toys and hiding them behind the couch mm -hmm. so that we can have some adult time. Mm -hmm. But this house has not only a living room, it has a separate family room where the kids can keep their mess and the kids each have their own rooms with a built-in loft space, which is gonna be trouble when they're teenagers because mm -hmm. it's an easy place to hide somebody. But anyway, mm -hmm. we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But the so the manifestation and the visualization came in, you know, <sighs> I truly believe that there's powers that work with you when you're really... It's the way God works, yeah. the universe, whatever you believe. Oh, yeah. The fact that you were doing that every morning mm -hmm. and watching that movie, I, I mean, I, you know, it's really funny. I, I, I show, you know, I've got pictures in the back of my planner that have been in there for 23 years, and there's a picture that looks just like the mansion I built literally right across mm -hmm. the bay here. It's probably worth $25 million now. Uh, it looks just like it. And I have another picture that looks just like the view from the, my compound here. God's got a sense of humor. I can see yeah. my whole place across the bay. <laughs> yeah. But I've, I've got another picture that looks just like it. It's crazy how, yeah. how, how it works. And, and, and you know, I've, I've manifested just about mm -hmm. everything in yeah. that book. I haven't yeah. got the six pack yet. It's under <laughs> there. But I, I had this picture of a guy with a six pack with my picture on it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. But I love the movie. I love yeah. the movie idea. Yeah. I've never even heard that before. It's very immersive. I teach people yeah. vision boards, but mm -hmm. love the movie. Guys, this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is how you get to eight thousand doors. Get the house of your dreams. You know, get the life that you want. You do it through this visualization and manifesting. I'm so glad that here's I asked the, you about this. Here's the kicker: yeah? is that in that competitive market mm -hmm. where that 1.2 million dollar house went for 2.5 million, our house we got at asking no kidding wow. no other offers 
Wow. For this incredible house. the way the universe conspired to help you make it happen. I could not have imagined it in my wildest dreams. That's so cool. That's so cool. Guys, I hope you got inspired by that because this is how it works. You want anything in life, you can manifest it. You've got to believe in it. You do it with gratitude, yes. You look Mm -hmm. at this stuff with gratitude. I'm certain you incorporated gratitude, yes. 100%. You know, I've gotten emotional being grateful for things I don't even have yet. Yeah. But... You know, and I always make a joke out of this, poo-poo it at your peril. This is how I had 50 million to lose (laughs) and how I got it back by doing exactly what Annie's talking about here. Don't poo-poo the woo-woo. No, 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 (laughs) I like that. I want to steal that. Don't poo-poo the woo-woo. All right, well, listen, Annie, this has been a real treat. I really appreciate you coming down here and, and, you know, all the way from San Francisco. And uh, this has been such a treat to see you again. The pleasure is all mine, Rod. Oh, thank you. All right, guys, that's a wrap. So one other quick thing, we encounter so many people that are frankly frustrated. You know, they're looking in the mirror and they're frustrated that they haven't been able to escape the rat race. They haven't been able to build cash flow to the point where they're able to have financial and time freedom with their families. You know, and maybe they see other people buying real estate and creating, you know, incredible cash flow. And they think, well, it's just scary. You know, buying apartments is intimidating. And I get it. See, that's why we created our Warrior Mentorship Program. They're our coaching students, and they've had extraordinary results. My students, I've been teaching about five years and own upwards of 140,000 units now that we know of, right? And we feel like it's just getting going. Now, we're looking to grow this group and really take it to the next level and honestly believe that the greatest transfer of wealth could be upon us right now with this current economic environment. Everything's going on sale. So we're looking for people who want to follow a proven framework, really like a blueprint or a map, literally step by step. And then they're able to leverage our systems and our incredible network to raise money and equity, to find deals and close those deals and build partnerships really nationwide. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become more in our incredible network and take advantage of the unbelievable opportunities that are upon us, you can apply to my Warrior Mentorship Program by texting the word CRUSH to 72345, or you can go to mentorwithrod.com. And what we'll do is we'll set up a call so you can check us out and we can check you out and see if it's a fit. Now, again, you can go to mentorwithrod.com or text the word CRUSH to 72345 to apply, and we will speak soon.